Welcome to Snakes and Otters, a pointless discussion of eternal questions. Get ready, we're about to live in your head rent-free. Welcome back to Snakes and Otters. This is episode 145. I am Martin. And I'm Robert. And I'm Francis, sitting in the captain's chair this time. Gentlemen, we're uh, shifting gears into the medieval territory. We've talked about this a little bit. Don't get uh, medieval on your butt. That's right. Don't get medieval on you. Do a little Marcellus Wallace. <laughs> that's, that's always cool. Yeah. I'm surprised, Martin, you didn't do that. I mean, that's... Well, you didn't even give me a chance. He well, beat me to it. Well, okay, that's, that's true. Every yeah. once in a while, i got to sneak one in. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, we uh, the, the medieval times is something that... I mean, I'm a medievalist in many ways. I love that period in history. There's so much richness there. Uh, we've kind of just never gotten there yet at this point, so we're kind of making it a point to yeah. do a little bit of that stuff and kind of smack dab in the middle of all that yeah. from a global, in many respects, at the time, perspective are the Crusades. Yeah. It's the big watershed moment. So much changed and yet so much didn't change <laughs> when it was all said and yeah. done. Uh, go, uh, so... You're, you're itching over yeah, here, Martin. Yeah, well, but let me... I want to nail you down a little bit here because the Crusades covers a lot of stuff. Oh, yeah. uh, It covers the Reconquista mm-hmm. in, in Spain. But I think uh, you want to... Which is later. Uh, yeah, that's, that's much no, later. No, that's, that's... I wouldn't... I well, wouldn't, but it's, it's called a crusade. Well, when you use the term crusades, that and some other things, and, and even at one time uh, against European pagans actions against them were, were called a crusade. But you want to narrow this down. Oh, you're, oh, And you want to talk specifically crusades in the Holy Land. Correct. The, the but, crusades. Yes. Yes. Uh, that's what we're talking about So here. we're talking... Because the concept of crusade was not new when when it was called yeah. forth. And it has been done on other other occasions. Basically, it is a calling force for calling forth of military forces for religious reasons. Onward, that's, Christian soldiers. Well, you, well, you dang straight. That's where that song comes from. Is kind yeah. of in that. In, right. In, in so that we're intention. talking 1095 to 1291. Correct. A 200 year period. That's that is correct. Right. Uh, right at the middle of. We're the, talking about the you know, and there are several, three big crusades essentially, yeah. three big crusades uh, in the Holy Land to liberate it from the Muslims, uh, which have been become a force at this time. Yes. This was. In many respects, you'll see a lot of discussion of Crusades in recent years that have tried to back away, walk back, as it were, the fact that, well, you know, it's all the Christians' fault. That's kind of where we've come at this point. Uh, There's lots of fault to go around. Uh, If you study the Crusades very much, it was inevitable. It was uh, the Crusades are not the starting point in this story. That's right. They are a response. To earlier events, yeah. and that is that is often yeah. lost. That's right. Yeah. You know, because the the territory that it was fought over for fifteen hundred, uh, thirteen hundred years has been in the hands of uh, a Muslim state of one form or another, mm-hmm. uh, give or take a little. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, modern people think, well, it's always been that way. No, that was the birthplace of. You know the Judaic religion as well as the Christian religion. That's right. Yeah, and it was, uh, you know, in Christian hands for uh, you know up and in basically into the seven hundreds. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, uh, essentially with the rise of Israel. Roman slash Byzantine Empire. So I mean, yeah, we don't want to make it be like, well, you started it, you Muslims. There's conflict there for centuries, right? For and, generations, and, and, the the Muslims expanded their territory by conquest. Christians expanded their territory by conquest. They're going to come into conflict. That's a, that is probably the best way to put that. This that's why I say this conflict was inevitable. Yeah, it just so happened. Everybody to, started it. Yeah, it, it just so happened to center around a place that was considered sacred by multiple religions. Because yes. even though the Muslims did not consider it as sacred as say the Christians or the Jews, it was still an important place. Yes, it's still uh, it, it's the. Prophet ascended into heaven mm-hmm. at right. that location. I think it's supposed to be the third holiest. Right, site at, at in Mecca and Medina, it is yeah. supposed to be. Yes, he ascended into heaven. At yeah, that, in, at in, that point. we're speaking of Jerusalem, the yes. city in particular. Yes. Yes. Well, the Temple Mount. It, exactly, and really, that's when they say the Holy Land for the Christians. It means a little bit more than just the city, but ultimately, that's kind of where this goes. Uh, 
Richard the Lionheart never got to see the gates of Jerusalem, even though he conquered a great swath in the Third Crusade, uh, reconquered yeah. of, of what would be called the Holy Lands, he d- still goes down as a failure because he never took Jerusalem, which was the whole point. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about Richard in a little bit because he's he's one of the central figures. Yes, uh, uh, the King of France is involved as mm-hmm. Philip... Philip, Philip I. Yes, Philip I. Right. Yeah. Uh, Richard Lionheart. Uh, and that's, of course, that's late. That's that's kind of the end of the story. The beginning of the story, uh, it goes back to, essentially, the Byzantines get very nervous, Constantinople, because yes. the Muslims have expanded and, and taken this space. It's right. they've, Turks. They've taken a good chunk yes. of yeah. what was the Byzantine, what really was the, what was left of the Roman Empire. We right. forget that sometimes. The Byzantine Empire is the Roman Empire. Yeah. The Roman Empire lasted until 14, was it 05 or 12? Or, uh, yeah. 1493 I it or was 57, but don't no, I think like before that. that. That was the 14th, 1400s where the, yeah. where the church... 1450s. Something yeah, like it was that. 1450s is yeah. the fall of Constantinople, yeah. if I'm not... Right, uh, so, right, that's when the Byzantine Empire, which is the real Roman Empire, yeah. falls. Correct. So, you know, it's a 1500-year empire. And it, and it survives through all this. And it survived through, until... And so they've lost a huge chunk of their, what was left of their territory. Because obviously yeah. they've lost the empire in the West. It's strictly an Eastern empire. Right. Yes. It's a, it's a Greek empire at this point, uh, off and on. Because they, they even they come into conflict with the Crusaders. And, and, and the Crusaders take Constantinople at one point. Yes, right. they sat, and set up a yeah. Latin kingdom, they call it. Well, yeah. Uh, but then, you know. They some of that, that's, that's, that's because of Venice and its power at the time. And it was. Kind of a, a shell game and a smoke and mirrors type thing. Yes. The, the Doge yeah. of Venice decides, you know, Constantinople is pretty rich. Let's see if I can, you know, this this crusade business. If I can incense these folks, because in many respects the Crusaders are thugs. The guys that go do this, they are certainly the ones that that go to Constantinople and sack it. I yeah, mean, I think you can make an argument that it's a movement that starts out with the best of intentions because. As it was preached, because remember, it's preached by the Pope, right? Urban uh, the very first one, yeah. And uh, so Urban the second, he says, "Look, we got to protect." And this is what start, the stated goal: protect travelers to the Holy Land. Because pilgrimage, pilgr- pilgrimages to the Holy Land never ended after Muslim rule came about, right? But it wasn't safe. That's correct. That's when it became threatening. So, and that's where. And plus, you know, they kept saying they keep taking a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more, and we got to stop this. So it starts out with what, from the Christian perspective, is noble intentions. Somebody, you know, probably millennials who heard me say that is like, oh my God, you a boomer? Well, first of all, no, we're not boomers. Yeah, boomers. that's right. We established yeah. this fact clearly. Second of all, you can't judge everything by today's standards because, for one thing, you know, today has no freaking standards. Yeah. Uh, except whatever you decide it is at the moment. Which is rabbit hole, rabbit hole. Rabbit hole, rabbit hole, yes. Uh, but my point is, though, it right, starts right. out with good intentions. It, it, it starts out with a an idea that is considered this area open. should be open to everyone. Right. And then it's taken advantage of by these military orders and... The kings that the kings participate, yes. you know, yeah. it becomes a, you know, a land grab in many ways. Land grabs, political, advantageous. Well, if I get on the side of the Pope, then I'm on his side and this other king is not. And Well, and, you know, we also have to remember that the, the church did not fund this. The kings who participated had to put the men in the field. They had to arm and equip them mm-hmm. and feed them and transport them. And transport them. So... From their perspective, they had to, you know the money had to come from somewhere. So, by the standards of the time, what happened was not just inevitable; it was understandable as well. Mm-hmm. Not because good, it became, but you understand how yeah, it happens. It, it, and that's how these military orders, Templars in particular, uh, gained so much influence mm-hmm. because they were the financiers. That's correct. This. Yeah, Templars they would get particular. granted stuff. That made incomes, mm-hmm. and then they would loan that incomes to these kings, uh, in in order to be influential. So I think that's a good spot to mention some books about this. Oh well, there are tons and tons, tons and tons. And tons. Uh, I'll give you the one that I brought off my bookshelf is, uh, and I think you're reaching for yours 
uh, there, Martin. Yes. Uh, we we love Terry Jones, of course, the late Terry Jones. We've we've toasted him at his passing from Monty Python fame. He's a medieval his, historian. He has a doctorate, had a doctorate in that. Uh, God bless him. And in 1995, uh, with the A and E Network, uh, he did a four part series on the Crusade, which is amazing. You can still get the DVDs. It is a, It's actually on YouTube. It's amazingly accessible because. Most of the time, once you start rattling off the names of the players and the dates and the locations, <laughs> which we're not going to do very much of because people's eyes glaze over. It's very confusing. It's very confusing. Other, other than sticking to like Richard the Lionheart or Philip the First. And that's correct. Well, you know, there's a couple other names you can throw out here. Uh, the only thing that's helped make it a little bit more accessible is some of the movies. We'll talk about those in a second. Yes. Uh, but there was a, a book, Terry Jones and Alan Aria wrote that went with that and that's on my bookshelf and it's right here uh it's it's marvelously it's got called a, i'm sorry called the called crusades very simply yeah <laughs> i didn't say it did I? uh it's 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 got plenty of pictures color it's uh it's beautifully made uh, i don't know how i'm sure you can find it on amazon used uh i mean it's 25 bucks when i bought it new but i bought it when it came out because a i like terry jones a i've always wanted that perfect crusades book this has got Terry's wit all over it, which makes something extremely difficult, extremely accessible. Yeah, that's, and that's great. That's one of the reasons I like it, and I know you. I know where you're going to go. Yes. So, and we're going to talk more about the Templars in another episode because they they get their own. But of course, they're inextricably linked to the Crusade. They Pretty existed because of the Crusades, yeah. and their eventual downfall is a result of the power they accumulated through the Crusades. Exactly right. Uh, but the Templars, the Rise and Spectacular Fall of God's Holy Warriors by Dan Jones, and, and that Dan, we've mentioned before. Again, he writes on this history very effectively. He did a book on just the Crusades, too. Yes. Uh, which Dan Jones is one of our favorite folks. Uh, uh, a lot of these his, uh, rock star historical writers, uh, he's one of them. Uh, he's, again, very accessible. You can read this, enjoy this, and not have to, as I yeah. said, have your eyes glaze over. Because yeah. he, this is a not everybody is the history nerd that, that each of us is. Uh, but you know, the, the, the Templars, it, that's an, I know what you said, we're going to do a, 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 an episode on them because they are an important piece of midi, medieval history. Yes. Uh, there's an important lesson in that that is applicable to today as well when you when we talk about the Templars. Uh, power that is founded on your ability to raise, spend, and lend money is very nebulous. <laughs> because yes. there's always somebody who can take it away from you. And, yeah, and it's political power and financial power come into conflict, and it's, at least the lesson of the Templars is, political wins. Right, because you have no base other than funds. That's right. Yeah. And funds can be taken from you, because especially this time, the funds are... Uh, as we would call them today, they are NFTs because they're real. They're they, you know you can't just print up another twenty trillion dollars and, and hand it out. You got to have real gold, That's and right. you know physical money can be taken from you mm-hmm. uh, by as force. It was. And again, they they generated this income through grants of land and yes. things like that because well, they were and then and well, they just the king had the power to just take that stuff away. And yank your income out from if, underneath. If you that. have a strong king, which Philip the Fourth of France definitely was. Well, you know, Sir Henry the Eighth certainly learned that lesson. Well, well. that's right. It's, it's kind of the same dance, different tune. Exactly. Uh, which is kind of unfortunate, but it also is almost inevitable because one of the things we haven't mentioned about this is this has the is the religious aspect of this yes. cannot be underestimated because in many respects that's why the Templars were granted the prestige and the respect, hospitalers too, to rise to the levels they rose to is because they're doing God's work. They've taken the cross. Yeah, I mean, originally they were very uh, pious and devout. Correct. I mean, it really was, it was a way of civilizing these warriors, these these thugs, you know, coming out of these conflicts and, okay, well, we've got to do something with all these guys, or they're just going to right, ride through... Right, there's no American West to send them to. Yeah, they're yeah. just going to ride through the countryside and chop everybody's head off. So they, they're forming these orders mm-hmm. and basing them off of uh, the previous religious orders, mm-hmm. and that's how you got favor with, with the Pope and got charters and, and 
uh, recognition mm -hmm. of these orders, and it re they really did pull men in mm -hmm. who had military experience, but then also, okay, you're going to live by these rules mm -hmm. and, and be devout um, and, and, and be a part of this order and, and as a civilizing thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can't underestimate. It's easy, it's easy for us to forget, because it's so not true now, uh, that for somebody like that, you have no no way of supporting yourself other than this. You have no uh, 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 support system that you can tap into. There's no veterans payments <laughs> system. There's no veterans hospital. Right. You know, there's no there's GI bill. No GI bill. This is the GI bill. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yes. this, yeah. This yeah. is yeah. So, so you, you have you have to have a religious order, and that's kind of where the orders come about. Is how do you take care of people in their old age? There is no such thing. Most people, there isn't any old age. Right, yeah. old age is forty. That's right. God, we're ancient then. <laughs> <laughs> so I know there's. Uh, uh, I'll go ahead and let you run with this, Francis, because I know there's a film you want to bring up. Oh well, yeah, and which is also one of my favorites. I do I do really enjoy this movie. Oh, uh, well, Kingdom, Kingdom of Heaven. Heaven. Kingdom of Heaven is. Uh, I hey, mean, it's full of hooey. Uh, not surprisingly, not as much as you might imagine. Uh, hey, first thing we love Ridley Scott. Anything Ridley Scott does, and Eva Green. Uh, well, Eva Green is very nice. Uh, uh, be careful. Martin, don't swoon Ooh, completely. She's yes, she's, pretty. she's a beautiful lady. Yes, and she's a fine, fine actress. And mm -hmm. This was an. Uh, this was you enjoyed Rise at Three Hundred Rise of the Empire of an Empire, didn't you? I haven't actually watched that one all the way through yet. Oh, really? I've seen little bits of it here and there, but it's you, actually very good. But I thought you would like it very much for the Eva Green. Eva Green, I know she played. Yes, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But and, and this was an earlier role for her. Yes, I, she had not done Casino Royale yet, if I recall correctly, but I may be wrong. It's. Contemporary. It's contemporary. It's, they're, they're close. She was an established European actress. Yeah. And and as I recall, Kingdom of Heaven and Casino Royale are about, about the, same the same time. time. Correct. And I forget which one came first. Uh, but that was... She took a role of a somewhat... Well, let me put it this way. It's very difficult to take something as big as the Crusades and make a movie about it and do it justice. Yeah. It's because you've, you've got, A, hundreds of years that you can work with. And Ridley Scott basically took... The first, the end of the first crusade, well, the, first, the end of the Crusader Kingdom. Yes. After the first crusade, which has successfully... Right, because that's... Yes, the first crusade has successfully establishes a kingdom of Jerusalem mm -hmm. under Catholic or, you know, Christian European monarchs. Correct. And which, they're not natives. They are Europeans. Yeah, leftover, leftover European royalty from right. All it's over. that third, second cousin, brothers, sisters, uncles, yeah, nephew that we put in charge over here because we didn't have any, anything else for him to do here in Europe. There's, yeah. there's some of that, uh, uh, and what they've done with that, it's the movie. It has a almost an Americanizing tint to it, which I don't like. It's like, go to Jerusalem and make your own way, because it's a meritocracy. It does it right, whereas Europe is, you know, it's all based on who you are. <laughs> I know, yeah, bullshit, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. I mean, that's, 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 that it's palatable for well, American well, audiences. That's yeah. why meritocracy, you can way. make an argument that, you know, yeah, it's meritocracy, because it's, the, you know... The, the strong man rules. That's right. Yeah. So, you, you yeah, in a way, it's very much yeah, that. But if you got, if it you got was enough, kind of a Wild West sort of situation, though. Because it is—it's completely brand new, right? So you could kind You've of torn down. Well, it, the it wasn't old structures. Yeah, agreed. It's not wrong. It's not. Yeah. It's just that's just the focus that Scott yeah, puts yeah. on it. Yeah. Uh, and he and he takes the Baron of Evelyn, uh, played by the awesome Liam Neeson, uh, yeah. and who finds his illegitimate son uh, Bailey on. Uh, Orlando Balian, Bloom. Orlando Bloom. You might as well just say yeah, that. Yeah, Balian. Balian, Balian of Evelyn. That's what yeah. I'm trying to spit out, and I can't quite get the yes. thing. Who was, a, who was a real person, and it's pretty well based on his life. Who's the guy who actually... But he, he was not like this noble... No, not at all. He was, he was a scumbag. Well, yeah, he's but he was the defender of Jerusalem against Saladin yeah. at the end. And yeah. he's the one that negotiated yes. the, 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 and, the peace. And the Battle of Hatin. Hatin, which is not shown... Unfortunately, which is kind of just the aftermath, kind that's of. That's correct. Which is really that was my criticism of the movie because, in many respects, of all the shit that went on, and if you want, if you can talk about the you know the siege of Accra. You can talk about the first crusade coming in and taking over. In many respects, and 
um, the Great Courses did a wonderful thing on this, mm -hmm. uh, which I have, uh, about great turning points, military turning points in history. Hattin is the moment of the Crusades, Crusades where everything changed. That's where there's no going back and it's over. Yeah, because... Um, yes, yes, Hattin is... It, the destruction of that army, the Christian army out of Jerusalem, really marks the failure of the Crusades. From, from the Christian future. perspective, yeah. yeah. It, from yeah. that point... It's inevitable. It's, it's over. all downhill. It's all downhill. It's all downhill. No matter what comes after, which Richard the Lionheart still has to come and he tries, but it's too late. Yeah, you, well, you've lost but, your base of, of operations. That's right. Well, and they, they know you're coming too. That's, yeah, you know that's the thing. The first time works because they don't really expect you to do this, and they yeah. don't know you, not militarily. Right. Like, well, because they've not had direct conflict. That's yeah. With the West. Yeah. That's right. But you know the. It's almost inevitable that the Crusades would be a failure for this reason and this reason alone, is that it was a European venture as opposed to, hey, the Byzantine Empire is striking back. Right. Because the, you know, they're the only ones that were close enough to actually truly support yes. any kind of effort. But the Byzantines were perfectly willing to let the West okay. die to secure... Constantinople, because that's essentially what happens. Uh -huh. It puts off the fall of the Byzantines yeah, for several yeah. hundred years. I'm going to let I'm going to let the Europeans secure our flank. Exactly. If you think about it, uh, that's exactly uh, Emperor what Emperor Alexei of Constantinople is freaking brilliant because he's yeah. the one. If, if we talk about Urban being the one that actually pulls the trigger, he's manipulated by Constantinople to do this. Yeah. In yeah. Many well, ways. it probably help us was out. not a. It, it probably wasn't a terribly hard thing to manipulate. No, though, not at all. Because again, you Which, know, there is a real danger to those that are are doing pilgrimages. Mm -hmm. There is a real theological issue here because you've got two competing monotheistic religions that claim the same origin, essentially. Mm -hmm. If you go back far enough to Abraham, uh, and the only thing they could agree on was that they hated the Jews. Yeah, and. Yeah, except when they needed money, of course. That's right. that's Europe's dirty little secret forever, is that they hated the Jews unless they needed money. Hmm. I mean, that, that's just the way that is, unfortunate. Um, but you know, it, it's almost inevitable that it's going to fail because it doesn't have the base, but it's also inevitable that it was going to happen because of what's going on you know, or at the time. Because you've got the context here. Mm -hmm. you got to think of everything in the context. So the Byzantine Empire... Is probably its largest, uh, actually not long before this, because even though the the, the, the West has essentially fallen, even though well the West has, has fallen, but you know they still control a good portion of southern Italy. That's right, and other places throughout the Mediterranean, and uh, all the way out to Iran still, because you got to remember the the Muslims are coming up out of Arabia. Mm -hmm. Yes, so you know it's it's a long slow march, but they also spend a lot of time over in in Africa. Yeah. Before they come back around uh, yeah. to to to, uh, uh, to to what is the Byzantine Empire, and so even though they're at what could be considered not necessarily the height of their power, but a pretty strong base, they're not apparently they don't have the political will yeah. to fight. Mm -hmm. Well, and and you've got yeah. Is this, well, let me. Yeah, there's a few other things here. So you've got this happening. Basically, this is all being ginned up throughout the first century of the new millennium. Mm -hmm. So that's a big deal, too, because a lot of people thought Christ was coming. Oh, yes. Yes. That is, know, that's a part of the In the year 1000. Well. Yes. So whether you want to say the year 1000 or the year 1033, you know, a thousand years from when he was crucified, however you want to, to take that, you know, there's all this... Oh, yes. They thought the world was ending soon. Right. And well, we... and for a lot of people, they thought the world was ending anyways because of all the stuff that was going on. Because you got to remember, we're also in the middle of... Uh, the schism with the Eastern churches just happened mm -hmm. in 1054. You know, and the uh, the Crusades are just 41 years later. That's nothing in church time. No. Nothing. And you've got all of this stuff going on. You know, you've got the Holy Roman Empire gets established in Europe, but it already fractures immediately yeah. into all these competing little factions. And so even though things are better, things are still falling apart. And this is so this is also a unifying... Yes. Event. Yes. So it's there's multiple things that they're trying to accomplish. We have an enemy to focus on now. We have an en you know, there's nothing like having an enemy to focus on. That's yeah. right. You know, pick any point in time and where there's strife, how do you come out of it? You find one enemy to focus on. 
whether it's you know a it, people, yeah, whether it's or real or a imagined. concept, That's because right. the Muslims become enemies not just to Constantinople but to the Persian kingdom as well. Yes, uh, so it's kind of like, hey, you Persian guys, we need to stop fighting because now we have a common enemy. Yep, yep, and you know, all of this stuff sets the stage for what becomes a total disaster in many ways. Yeah. Because they're initially successful, and yet, ultimately, it's inevitable that they fail. But what does it do? Well, first of all, you mentioned Richard the Lionhearted. He fails because he doesn't get to Jerusalem. Right. But he also even fails to get back to England. What does that do to England, mm. that Richard is gone, and then never returns because he dies on the way home? Right? Uh, sort of, kind of. Ish. Yeah, it's, it's, well, he's in prison for a while, but he, he pays the ransom to get out of Right, he's imprisoned by another uh, uh, king, Henry of Henry of uh, of uh, Regensburg, uh, in, in German, basically. German, yeah, yeah. He's, he's imprisoned in German. Way. Right, you because know. you know, once you fail on the way back, you still got to pay for yourself to get back. So you know, you're right. gonna kind of <clears throat> yeah. Richard uh, was take some beloved, liberties on the way. Richard back. was beloved by his people, even though he rarely set foot on the damn co- on the damn island at all. Yeah. Uh, well, because he because was a warrior. warrior. He, yeah. It was, the they, war, they it was that warrior yeah. prestige that he brought to that. Uh, he's, he's seen as a strong, very militaristic, take no prisoners. Very at, noble. At which was totally, yeah, he's seen as yeah. no, that, with, that, uh, with that concept of nobility. Which, of course, if you study Richard very much, he was not that at all. He was a thug. Uh, and he was a brutal, brutal uh, yeah, but he won most he, of the oh, time. Oh, he won, absolutely. And, well, and, and they had somebody, for things that went wrong, locally, they had somebody else to focus on, his brother. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah <laughs> correct. Uh, well, so, if it weren't for Robin Hood, we'd all be in trouble now. <laughs> That's right. So, but, I mean, fortunately, Errol kind of Flynn was there. talking yes. about, though. Yes, you know, so, so the Crusades give us Errol Flynn. Yeah, ultimately, <laughs> yes, ultimately. Okay. But, you know, this is this is kind of stuff that I'm talking about, though, that because... This is such a massive thing that affects literally almost the entire known world yeah. Yeah. Uh, from the Western, you know, European uh, Near East perspective. And you think about all the lives uh, that are lost doing it, all of the uh, money that is spent on this. You know, you can make an argument that this uh, either propelled us out of the Middle Ages or held us back in the Middle Ages. That's, that would be a very good argument. I personally think it uh, helped propel us out. Oh, okay. Well, I'm kind well, of uh, held well, us back. And... See, I think it helps propel us out for a lot of reasons, not the least of which is war, especially then, drives technological advance. That is true. That is true. Uh, also, there's a lot of money changing hands. A lot of money changing around. hands, so there's a lot of structures. Banking is really built up. Yeah, uh, yeah in, in not quite the modern sense, but well, it becomes more of a thing. It's, it's more of a... It's an international thing now. Yeah, it's essentially global from, in, yes. from their perspective, yes. uh, which would, had not been. They, their kingdoms were much more isolated before. Yes, and so now there's not. more travel. Uh, the, the rulers and even the people are more cosmopolitan, just because they know about these things. Hundred years prior to this, probably most peasants had never heard of Constantinople and Jerusalem, other than in scriptures. You know, oh, it's a real place. I could actually go there. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know. Oh, actually, they probably, maybe, probably wouldn't have thought that because you know peasants didn't go anywhere. Well, you know, although you know. the Pe- but, Peter's Crusade it was nothing but that. The but very, that's right. Well, there's also the children's uh, crusade, uh, crusade which later. Was horrible. Yeah, I mean, essentially, they basic uh, thousands upon thousands of people come together and march off to death. <laughs> they, right. they never go any. They just basically die along right. the way. So it's a terrible thing in both cases. Yeah, you know, this is one of those. It, it's one of these events that is it. Changes the course of how European history goes, not just, you know, because uh, they were trying to do something. In, in, I mean, it changes it because of all of the players that are involved and the things they do. You know, there's an opportunity cost, mm-hmm. culturally and historically, to mm-hmm. something yep. like this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you know, to me, that's one of the fascinating. I love it things. when you talk like an economist. Oh, well, thank it's you. awesome. <laughs> opportunity. But, but cost. Martin, you were thinking the opposite. Yeah. I, it, it, exactly for that reason, uh, the opportunity cost. Yes. What could you have done if you weren't pouring money down a hole? But would this, you have done that, though? That's yeah. the thing. I, exactly. I think you That's might very, have this very surrounded, Robert. I think you're exactly right. Uh, in many respects, it's a very Darwinistic approach. Yeah. But uh, that which does not kill us make us stronger, if you want to go Nietzsche on this, uh, which uh, will, I think there's some value 
in recognizing that that out of the ashes came a stronger, uh, more connected Europe. I don't know about stronger, but I would definitely say more connected. Uh, you could make the argument, I think, that that uh, the uh, the way the Habsburgs come to power and what they do uh, is not necessarily a direct outgrowth, but it's a consequence because you start seeing all of these isolated kingdoms, uh, Francis, that you were talking about. Yep. Uh, they become aware of and, more importantly, set their eyes on a much larger stage. So you've yes. got all of these... Ambition grows. Yes, ambition grows. And especially in Central Europe, where there is no central power anymore, it is this Holy Roman Empire with its elected, yeah. uh, bribed <laughs> elections, it, uh, it, emperors. Yeah, it, it does. It marks also an, an emergence of France yes. as, as, a, as a much larger player, much larger scale player. Mm -hmm. um, it also, you know, you're talking about early on uh, the Recon Reconquista. The Reconquista. Uh, it, you know, it does start during this time, but it doesn't end until the 1490s. It, yeah, because you know, let's face it, years. Spain is not exactly the easiest place to fight, uh, to you know, to drive an enemy from, because yeah. it's it, it's not like you've got a nice flat terrain that you can just go right at them. It, it's not quite that that simple. Well, and it's very difficult for them to get help. Exactly. <laughs> Cross the Pyrenees to help them out the or to invade them. Yeah, so. or they've, they've got to come by water, and that's yeah. not real easy either. Yeah. So, you know, it's there's all kinds of stuff that, that is going on because of all this. This feels like a good time for a break. I've been, we've been trying to work it out. I know you Take over. You're the captain, Francis. Well, take over uh, our you break. Know, well, uh, you know, a, a bourbon break. Um, I'm of the opinion, gentlemen, that I had, uh, I was out at a mutual friend's last night. We had some bourbon. He keeps it in a freezer. It is chilled like you wouldn't believe. Interesting. I had it. I had it that way last night. Uh, it was Evan Williams. I forget the variety. And it doesn't freeze. No, of course no, not. No, because it's alcohol. Yeah. yeah. yeah but it's uh, you know comes out in a frosted bottle, and you pour that bad boy into your glass, and it is beautifully Pre -chilled. chilled. Yes. Beautifully chilled. Interesting. And it does not, see, because that's why I've been drinking it neat, is because I don't always want it watered down. Now, sometimes that's a thing, and you want well, it that way. Yeah, because I'm really of the opinion that the, the splash of water, at the very least, yeah, uh, it, it is it bring is it an, out. It is an intention, that's correct. Yes. And there's, you know, some people prefer one way or the other and all that stuff like that. But I've kind of, kind of like it. I want the chill, but I don't want the water most times. It depends on the bourbon. And that's it really correct. does. And the it one, really does. But yes, I do like it chilled better because, as you know, we have found, you know, it, it, it's just amazing what a little bit of chill and, and water does to the, the, the mixture and the, the taste and the flavor. And, and, and true bourbon aficionados will say that's deliberate. That's the, that's the point. You know, and yes. you're supposed to be able to do that. Uh, and I just thought that was an ironic something. Very we've not interesting. Tried. Very interesting experiment to work on. And I, 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 I have to clear some space in the freezer for one of the bottles then. Yeah, and just absolutely. And just, and just Unfortunately, my freezer is stuffed with uh, French fries and uh, frozen pizzas. But well, that's because <laughs> you have sons that you know are just barely college age and above. <laughs> yes. Yes. But it works. But uh, yes, I thought I would uh, I would share that with yeah. you all for our, for our bourbon break this time here. Something, you know, and now for something completely different. I think you have mentioned this before, but we've never really talked about the results of it. Right. I mean, it's always yeah. been, you know, why don't we ever hear about that? And, you know, listeners, by all means, you know, we're not experts on all this, even though we talk about it all the time. Um, why isn't that a thing? Why, don't, why isn't that common? It doesn't appear to be. Well, you know why it's not common? It's because when you go to a bar... You can't chill your your bourbon and still make it visible on the shelves. No, there's, yeah, I can I can get that. Yeah, and plus, you know, it's only <coughs> in the last hundred years that you can even do such a thing. Well, yeah, I mean, because you know, a lot of times wine is served at room temperature. Rarely is it chilled, and uh, a lot of personally, I'm not real big on room temperature wine. No, not particularly. Uh, it depends, but you know, well, in in Europe, beer is served room temperature. Barbarians. Well, that's right. Well, I'd like to think so. That's right. We yeah. snobs over here off in the in the well, new world. I mean, technically, you know, ale yeah. can be because it doesn't have to be cold. It's not fermented at cold. It's lager that's fermented cold. Right. So, but anyway, uh, well, I'm excited to have you guys back. We're at Studio M, Max and relaxing in the comfy chairs. Robert's in the recliner. 
It seems to be. It almost reclines too much. I have to keep. I have to sit up. Otherwise, I feel like I'm laying back. Right, yeah, <laughs> but uh, it, it seems to help. Uh, really bring out your uh, your uh, your abilities here. <laughs> you makes you very comfortable, and, and you're, you're rocking and rolling this episode. He's the Ayatollah of rock right. and roll. Yeah, he's, he's oh, awesome. Awesome. We, we love using mm-hmm. that. I love using that phrase. Uh, I, I'll steal it as yeah. often as I can. It just it but, works. Yeah, Francis and I are kicked back on the couches, and we. We're projecting Studio a, and 34 of the Nakatomi Tower. Nakatomi Building, uh, behind the waterfall, waterfall down the hall from Ellis. Yes. Yeah, that's right. We're starting to get that right. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I can never hear that too much <laughs> when we are here. <laughs> I, I'm always thrilled when the guys are here at Studio M. It's so, you know, great. It, it's, you know, after spending how many months of 2020 not being able to record in person... I treasure these moments. Uh, Indeed, yes. It's a we've kind of found ourselves. You know, we you, you slide into a habit of you know where we sit and how we talk and different things like that. Yeah. Uh, and that's something that Zoom just doesn't recreate. Right. Well, you know, as bad as we are about talking to over one another, Zoom just made it horrible. That's right. <laughs> well, we lose the physical cues. Yeah, you uh, really do. Yeah, yeah, and it was um, we we've kind of got into a groove where it's not bad anymore no 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 it hasn't been for a while <coughs> we took a step back during the zoom meetings i think yeah because um, we were doing pretty good uh, so. prior to that but anyways yeah, yeah. yeah. Was... as we grow in this and we work on it we're we're learning not to stomp on each other wait no no no, no, no. <laughs> yeah, <there you> go. <laughs> Speaking so, of stomping let's slide ourselves back to uh yes. to the crusades a little bit so we can so uh, some, so you started asking this question, so I, I'm going to yes, jump please on. Continue. So I was talking about uh, what you know, the impact this had beyond. But I, I, to me, that's why I think is more important about the than what actually happened, because ultimately the status quo antebellum remained, uh, to borrow a phrase from American history, for another couple hundred years. Well, really. Even beyond that, because uh, you know, until the the British and the French come back in in relatively modern times, uh, it, you know, and, and kind of colonize the area, uh, it really does remain in Muslim hands for centuries. Mm-hmm. And there's really only a you know maybe 150 200 year time where right, right. it's not. Right. Yeah, but they they make a rapprochement with everybody, and in other words. Pilgrims can come and go freely and safely, and that's kind of where this ends. Uh, well, the kind of, you know, that's the smart thing to do. <laughs> money, money, money. Well, that's correct, and I think every, and uh, the the Muslim rulers uh, they very quickly realize because you know they're they're very uh, enlightened when it comes to finances. I mean, Arabic numerals, for goodness sakes, one of the greatest inventions that ever was. We, right. I mean, great, they they, they, they come to the idea of hey, these Christians aren't so bad as long as they go home. Well, that's right. Yeah, and you know, so and it's, if, it's, if, it's, if, as long as well, we let them, you know, uh, come in, Crusaders stop, stop having bandits and that kind of thing. Take the money legit, and then send them home. Well, you know, Crusaders are like company and fish; they both stink after three days. That's right. Yeah, and uh, well, here they, but here, here, I mean, here here's where I want to go though with something because you're absolutely right. Status quo ante comes back basically to the whole for the thing. most part yeah uh, so there's it's like yeah all of this was a big fart in a whirlwind 200 years of it but the effect on Europe is tremendous yes they had no no effect in the Holy Land but the effect in Europe again this France more powerful mm-hmm. becomes seen as a guardian of the church yeah it is the so, eldest daughter of the church so then you you know you end up with these conflicts where it's not safe for the Pope to stay in Rome and you know, the Avignon Papacy mm-hmm. and That's right. and then the destruction of these orders and then you know where I come in <laughs> is the things that the church has done to attract Crusaders and to justify these military actions, the things like indulgences. Oh yeah. Becomes well, you know, this you're going straight to heaven if you kill a, a, a Muslim. Yes, that's that. I'm glad you brought that up because yes. I think that's one of the darker sides of this. It is it, it, the it, religious it, uh, manipulation yes. of folks in order to for political ends. Yes, 
that the seeds are sown in the crusades of the Reformation. Your, yeah, you can redeem your life uh-huh. and go straight to heaven by doing if, what we if, say. If you'll go to the Holy Land. And kill a Muslim. That's right. And like you said, it becomes this crucible Mm -hmm. then of the Protestant rebellion, as you would call it, or the Reformation. You're you're exactly right because there you can history is sometimes wrong (laughs) (laughs) because reason tells us, and of course that's starting around that time of you know the Enlightenment and reason and stuff like that. Realize, wait a minute, that can't be right. You can't go kill if if Jesus Christ says you know love thy neighbor and all that stuff. You Killing for him makes no sense. Yeah, that's just justifying what you wanted to do. Yeah, through religious so means. It's, so it's, therefore, it shows the church yeah. as, in the re, in the reformers' minds, hopelessly corrupt. Yeah, for those who remained, it because was, they really felt like and they, they were, were corrupt. They were trying to rescue the souls of the average person from an institution that had been corrupted by Satan. But in that the was, Catholic Church. That mean, that's, their, that's the reformer zeal, the, the, the Protestant zeal that comes out. Um, well, as uh, Chesterton, who uh, we will talk about later this month, uh, once observed, you know, the reformers often write about what is wrong, but wrong <laughs> about how to fix it. Yeah, that's wrong about how to make it right. Right, because yeah. ultimately those who, those who stayed Catholic worked to reform the church from within. Right, because, you know, people forget this, but practically every major order in the church started out as a reform order. That's correct. Yeah. Franciscans are the, the most famous. Yeah. You know, Francis receives the message, go rebuild my church, which he first interprets as, you know, built, physically building this local church. But no, it was a call to reform the entire church. Yeah. And it's, institutions always drift from their purpose. Absolutely. Mission drift. <laughs> Absolutely, well, yeah. and the, scope creep. You know, if you yeah, want to put it in a yes, technical uh, terms. Uh, well, and in many respects, creep. it's it's such a thing is built into our liturgical calendar now, and it's and it's yes. uh, the entire concept of Ash Wednesday and Lent, the repentance series mm-hmm. season. It's have mercy on us, for we have sinned. That's the whole point of saying, take a hard look at what you're doing. You may not be right. Well, and part of the problem is though, those who most need to take that look can't yeah because they're the ones who are the most convinced that they are right that is correct uh the the, uh the xenophobia or any of these other underlying issues here they are very hard to root out especially once power is brought into the equation which is that was the reform that was the Protestant reformation was was zeroing in on that right there were absolutely abuses of indulgences however the theological basis of an indulgence is not unsound. It's how it was presented and literally sold yes. to people. You know, the whole idea that, because, uh, you know, uh, James says, faith without works is dead. And that's where we get some of our basis for this. The whole idea is that you better yourself now, better prepares you for later. And that whole idea got so totally perverted. Uh, in the need and the drive to, especially more so the the uh, the, the, uh, the drive to build the new St. Peter's than the Crusades, but you know a lot of this stuff is you know it, it's going to have earlier roots, sure. Uh, and one of the things about this is, and this is what I like, that in fact we're going to do a lot of these. None of this happens in a vacuum, right? And so exactly. much of this is just one of those touchstone moments. The yes. Crusades, but as as we always say, history is a thread. You're, you're always building these pieces. That's right. So it's like, well, if we don't pour all this money down this hole in the Crusades, what could have happened? Well, I mean, is the Reformation inevitable? I don't know. But it's oh, certainly... I, I, oh, you're going what if on us here. Yeah, okay. certainly, it's, yeah. certainly, again, it's, it's fueled by this history of what the church is doing. Right. So... You know, if, if you're going to go to, to that length, I, I like this idea. I, of course, we don't know. It's really too complex, and we're not Harry Seldon, so we can't really determine how this is going to go in a large way around. But I'm thinking Europe is still less united, less cosmopolitan. They're, they're more... Uh, they, they, they achieve much less greatness on the world stage without the Crusades. 
because otherwise they're fight, they're just fighting border wars with each other. You, you could care less about what goes on in Italy. So the unifying aspect of the Crusades helps Europe grow. Absolutely, there's no question. It, uh, that's, that's even despite the pieces of this that eventually lead to the fracture of the church. Correct. Right. Oh yeah, the, the intellectual politically growth speaking, is worth it. That's I'm not necessarily making a moral judgment about that. I'm just simply saying that's what happened, and it has long range consequences because a far more cosmopolitan Europe is how the New World is settled. Yeah, you know that it had, you, you you have to have reached a certain level of ascendancy politically speaking uh, in order for Columbus to do what he did. And, and to change to change all that. So for the world to grow, yeah, it often grows uh, in, in pain. To steal oh, yes. From, to steal from Joe Straczynski, because that's, yes. that's, that's one of his quotations. Well, I just I want to kick one more thing out to you, and I'll let you wrap up, uh, Francis. But this idea of the renewal, it's a season of renewal where we are now. Yeah. Uh, a season of, of reflection, of rebuild. Uh, welcome to... Louisville's new Archbishop. Oh, yes. Way, Archbishop Fob. Yes, F A B R E, and the R E is silent. Very, so. very Louisiana. Oh, very much so. So, a lot, a lot like Brett Favre. Well, it's, <laughs> yeah, and hopefully a lot smarter, though. Well, he, well uh, I'd I, like to think so. I had the opportunity to meet him this past week. Uh, uh, he's, he's a really wonderful, humble. Uh, so, does he have a strong Louisiana accent? No, it's not particularly strong. Okay. It's there. You, I mean, if you, if you check it. I was kind of hoping, because you're honest, I, I kind of like that. He, he's, it is beautiful. I he's know, from Huma Thibodeau. That's where he's at. Huma Thibodeau, that's yes. Right. That's right. That's his but, uh, little bitty just, poor diocese in Louisiana. Yeah, what I read there, uh, his personal motto, comfort my people. That's correct. Yes. I thought it was very moving. He and is, it, and a, it's going to be great. He's very pastoral. I can, you know, uh, yeah, having, having he met him. Really and feels like a shepherd. Him, yeah. Yes, he is. He's African American, uh, and sent to a city uh, that needs has no small amount of has no problems s- uh, of, of, uh, in the area of race. Yeah. So this is uh, both in and out of the church. That's correct. Yes, yes. Uh, and I, I was given great hope with recognizing that Rome actually was perceptive enough to recognize that his appointment here is not just for the good of the local church, but for the good of the local community. They actually cared about that. Yes. He was seen yes. as a sensitive appointment because of the community. Yes, the opening, as, as Archbishop Kurtz retires, yes. the opening seen as a sensitive appointment. Correct. And they really worked through a lot of things mm-hmm. in deciding on who to appoint. So, right. and, yeah, so as this episode drops on March 4th. Uh, we are 26 days as of the drop of this episode away from the installation of right. uh, Archbishop Fob as the, the, inst- the ar- even though he is not actually installed now, he is still called Archbishop. Because yes. uh, technically, that's just a title. He's not even he doesn't have to re- be reordained or anything. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, so we are just uh, just shy of four weeks so, away from. Yeah, by the time we get to our next history episode, it'll be a done deal. So welcome. To Archbishop Fob, we are looking forward to your renewal uh, as the new our shepherd of, right. uh, of our of our. Even this heathen wishes you the, well, the you best. Well, thank you, heathen. You, yes, <laughs> of you all people, best. to and bring again, that up. That's what very he, very you know, encouraging. That. What I read about him, and I, I thought, well, this is a just the right person. That's well, that's you know, that's what we kind of pray for. Yeah, well, you know, you, you never know what you're going to get until you get it, but there's always hope in the beginning, and that's you know, you have to start from there. A triumph of hope over experience, like second marriages. <laughs> well, I wouldn't know anything about second marriage. <laughs> None of us would. Would you either for that matter? <laughs> yeah. All well, right, that's boys. Just something I read about. Okay, but, let's wrap this bad boy up. Any final thoughts uh, before we move on? Um, well, I, unfortunately, I had to step away for a second during the final seconds uh, before we went to the Archbishop Bob thing. So, if this is uh, covering ground that you covered for those few seconds I was away, I apologize. But um, ultimately, I think that the the Crusades uh, had a net positive effect on history. It's kind of where we were leaning. Uh, yeah. Obviously, there's a lot of negative effects on history because uh, death and destruction. That's correct. Yeah, you can't, uh, there's you can't there's no that escaping away. that. But you know, a lot of that death and destruction might have happened eventually, not necessarily those specific people, uh, because of the push west by uh, the, the caliphates. Mm. Uh, so... Maybe it just uh, 
you know, put it off. And of course, you know, the Battle of Lepanto in, in the 1500s, uh, you can argue is the, the final battle of the is, Crusades. Yeah. Right. Uh, where the... Yeah. Uh, it, it's very tempting to look at the Muslim expansion as very monolithic, but it really was not. No, it was it not was a straight march. It multiple, seemed like it because it took so right. long. And it's multiple groups with different agendas. Yes, there uh, are... A lot more competing groups than you know, we realize. Yeah. Uh, some of the caliphates were, hey, leave us alone. We're just going to sit here. And some were, we need to expand. And Saladin's different from the ones that came before and the ones who came after. Yes, there, yes. there were. Uh, and we, I'm, glad you, I'm glad you mentioned that because we didn't talk too much about personalities. We mentioned Richard Lionheart, but we would be remiss if we did not speak of the genius of Saladin. In, yeah. in English, Salahadin. In Salahadin, in, in, uh, and he's wonderfully portrayed in the movie Kingdom of Heaven. And there's a, there's, a, I'll just give you this. There's a brief moment where, when that movie aired over in Arabic countries, uh, there's a scene where, after Jerusalem falls, Saladin goes into the city and he sees a fallen cross on the ground. He picks it up and puts it back onto the table. And in Arabic countries, there's a cheer when he does that, which tells me that they recognize we must get along, even today. Because if you go to the Arab Arab world, the entire concept of crusades, they certainly haven't forgotten. And well, that's that's a bit of a new uh, take on things. You know, yeah. the the modern thing in 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 the Muslim countries uh, is that the crusades never ended. That the West have been constantly going after, them, which is not true. No, no, exactly. Uh, and it's it's starting to recognize that we can and must get along. I'm hopeful. Uh, I don't, well, I don't know. I I, I probably have a bit more negative uh, view on that. It, it, whether they the cheering, I don't know. I, I doubt that was universal as well. Well, I mean, it was reported as it happened somewhere. That's yeah, I'm sure it did somewhere, but you know, uh, country to country, things are very different over there, just as they are here. Yeah. Uh, you know, but that's, back a, to, that's the important thing to recognize. Yeah. It's not the Muslim expansion was not monolithic. It, right, it was. It was not steady. It was not uh, controlled necessarily. It was opportunistic. It just was as, yes, different different groups. Yeah. moving uh, from different areas. It seemed monolithic, I think, from the Western perspective because you know it felt like it was. It, I mean, it largely it was a uh, uh, fueled by religious sensitivities. Uh, for political purposes, just like the Crusades were. Yeah. Uh, so you make an argument that you know one side was crusading and so was the other. Yeah. But my point was largely it's a net positive because of the changes forced upon Europe, uh, where they started to to once again yeah. see themselves uh, as part of something larger. Uh, this adventuring yeah. in the in in Muslim lands, uh, I think broadened horizons intellectually as well as a- in terms of ambition. And, you know, you were saying, Francis, that uh, Columbus doesn't happen without that. Well, that's certainly true because, you know, the, the rulers in Spain uh, were looking for a way to basically put their mark on things. So they wanted that new economic route to, mm-hmm. uh, the, the, uh, to the other side of the world, which, well, they found something in the way. <laughs> Uh, which, better, actually. yeah. So uh, Francis was very much in the same place, you know. He's uh, it, it's a the unifying aspects led to this greater intellectual cultural growth, the Renaissance, and, a, and the Renaissance gets gets there. That's correct. With because sounds of the Crusades, like a, sounds like a great point to end this, boys. Shall we? Shall we? Shall we? Yes. Speak this? up. <laughs> sorry, oh, Lord. Sorry, sakes, you, boys. I'm well, I, I'm just looking at the see. We can see on the screen there those really small lines. That's more you. Fine. <laughs> fine. Whatever. I've tried to give you the signal, kind of. Yeah. Kind of bring your voice back up. All right. Well, but you're a very moderate speaker. Yes. You, when you, you when you end a point, you drop down so very softly. You just make a very very genteel point, but it doesn't work well when fine. Uh, whatever. The, I'm we're just. Trying to make sure that everybody can hear us and understand us, that's all. Sounds wonderful. Next What's next? Epi- next episode, we're going to talk quotations, and we will speak loudly when we do that. We might even <laughs> use a special voice. We might even we might, we might speak Australian if you really want to go there, but we not necessarily. We're going to talk about great quotations. Code of Honor is next. Don't miss it. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh,
Hope you enjoyed another pointless discussion of eternal questions. Remember, new episodes publish every Friday at noon Eastern. Spread the word. We're on all the major podcast platforms. And leave us a comment or review because that helps others find us. We're on Instagram, Twitter, as well as our website, snakesandotters.com. I'm Martin. And I'm Robert. And I'm Francis. Join us next week, same snake time, same otter channel.